Luke chapter 12, verse 7. Since you are so much more precious to God than a thousand flocks of sparrows, and since God knows you in every detail, down to the number of hairs on your head at this moment, you can be secure and unafraid of any person, and you have nothing to fear from God either. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was given a script upon my birth, and I have a feeling perhaps all of us were given scripts upon our births, and my particular script said something like this, be a girl who grows up into a woman and marries a man. Have a few babies. You can be liberal, but not radical. You can work, but that husband should definitely make more money. You can have friends, but your one real true relationship is that monogamous marriage that you are in. And that script didn't work for me. And every couple of steps along the path in that script, I'd find that following it became more and more excruciating and confusing and stifling. And I'll take you back now to the 90s. I remember one time I was in elementary school and there was a 60 minute special on our gray boxy TV and the people on the television were talking about trans people. And I sat on the floor and I stared in wonder and then I very slowly glanced backwards at my parents to see if I could decipher their thoughts and their feelings through any kind of facial expressions. So I turned real slow and I tried to figure out, did they think that this was okay? Real, fake, disturbing. Most of all, is there any chance that they saw their own kid in that TV special? Is there any chance that they saw me and the stories on TV? I don't think they did, and I didn't really get much information from their expressions, but I got a lot of information from that TV special. I got to learn that outside of my conservative little town in rural San Diego County, there were other people and I wasn't alone. The script that I was given was that I was a cisgender female and I could grow up to be a woman and that that woman would wear makeup and dresses, especially to church. And this script was so very hard to follow. And that 60 minutes special opened my eyes to the fact that there was perhaps another way of being in the world and that some people didn't or couldn't or wouldn't follow the scripts that they were given. Here's another little story about scripts. When I was in high school in that same small conservative town in rural San Diego County, I stood in line at a Sizzler restaurant with my mom and I had been hanging out lately a lot with two different boys and they were both named Chris, very popular name. So there was Chris B and there was Chris W and they were both so much fun to be around for very different reasons. Chris B and I liked to play music together. Chris W and I went to punk shows downtown. Chris B was sweet, nerdy glasses. Chris W already had a few tattoos. And so I was pretty sure that I was madly in love with both of them. And my mom cornered me and she asked me in that restaurant line, which one will you be promoting? She meant which one was boyfriend material? Which one might I say I was dating and through those words imply monogamy and some kind of pre-scripted relationship trajectory? And so I responded anxiously that I didn't know the answer to her question and then I spent the rest of the dinner in a very sweaty panic. And later that week I went on a date with Chris B and then I snuck out my window to go to a local ska band with Chris W because the script that I was given was that there was only one way to build relationships and that to do that is to prioritize romance, exclusivity, and monogamy, to lean into scarcity, and to find security in relationship labels. And to do that, that was standard and any deviation from that was unethical or slutty or wrong. And that script was really hard to follow. 
So these are just two stories from my own life, from the younger parts of my life, about scripts that were handed to me that really didn't work out, that needed to be broken down bit by bit, tearfully, ragefully, truthfully, over the course of decades, until what was left was a queer trans person who is very much polyamorous, until what was left was actually just me. And I work each day to identify when I'm operating from a script that I was handed by, by society, by my family, by community, by my generation, by media, by the church. I work each day to identify these scripts, to really turn them around, flip them inside out, dare I say, queer them until what's left is something more raw and truthful, something God might even recognize as sacred. And so I wonder today, you queer beloveds, on this Pride Sunday, what scripts are still operating in your life and how might you deconstruct them? How might you shatter them? How might you rebuild something more true and beautifully you? When you were growing up or in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s, were you told something about your gender and the roles you had to fill? Were you told something about your orientation and the ways you had to live it out? Were you told something about the sex that you were supposed to have? Something about the way that you were supposed to look? I wonder, can you identify those scripts? Can you bring them to the forefront of your mind this week? Can you consider whether they're serving you? Whether they're serving the God who made you? Because if they are not serving the individual that God made you to be, those scripts might just need to be shattered because pride in its original form is not very gentle. It's riotous, it's intense. It's a time in which bricks were being thrown through cop car windows, and that's the level of intensity we need in order to shatter these societal scripts that we have been given in order to queer our lives and actually be set free. We need Marsha P. Johnson level of intensity. We need Reverend Troy Perry level of perseverance. And so I wonder this week, might you muster that intensity in your heart, in your mind, in your soul? Might you be able to bring that feeling of pride so intensely to the surface that you might throw bricks at these societal scripts, shattering them and making space for God's true light to shine? In tonight's scripture, we read that God knows every hair on our heads, and that's a little intense. This scripture is almost a riddle, and it's certainly based in extremes every hair on our heads, why would that be necessary? I think it's necessary because it drives home this point that you and me and us, we are so valuable. We are so valuable that the creator of heaven and earth and all the things in them is so invested as to know this minutia of our lives. Because if we can really internalize that that's how God feels, Imagine how much God delights when the bricks are thrown and the societal scripts come tumbling down to reveal God's beloved children, us. Friends, I think of Jesus Christ who is rising from the grave and in doing so proving once and for all that not even death can keep us down. Those who desire to be liberated won't be stopped by prince or principality or authority or death. Those who desire to be liberated won't stop until they, until we, are set free from that which binds us. So on this Pride Sunday, I leave you with these words, and these are perhaps some new scripts, some affirmations which we queer people cannot possibly hear enough from pulpits because we're so used to around the world hearing the opposite. So I will say these unequivocal words with a stole on and all these degrees and ordinations because I think queer people around the world need to know these things. One, you are valuable and beloved, worthy and called as God's own, not in spite of who you are, but rather as you fully are. Two, the institutional church owes you and all of us and all our queer family a massive apology or a thousand apologies for the harm that has been and continues to be done. You, on the other hand, don't owe the church a single apology for keeping yourself safe and for finding sanctuary where you have throughout your life. You and the way that you have sex or don't have sex are not wrong. 
who you have sex with and how you have sex are not wrong or in any way displeasing to God. And finally, you are exactly as God made you. That name and pronoun that you hear God whisper to you in the night, the outfit that makes you smile, the voice, the walk, the song, the way of being in the world, all that wonderfully made. So friends, my charge to you this week, this Pride Week and this Pride Month, is to remember who you are, God's beloved one, to cling to queer community in the midst of political upheavals and social unrest, to know that you belong here at MCC Boston and in the queer community at large. And finally, to examine the societal scripts that still weigh you down and to queer them one by one, deconstructing them until what is left is only the dazzling truth of who you are. So happy pride, amen. It's a time in our service where we collect an offering. To those attending MCC Boston through our YouTube page, you too can participate by going to our website at mccboston.org and clicking on the donate button there for that purpose. Thank you for being a part of our church family. Members and friends of MCC Boston, history records our denomination, the United Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches, as being foundational in the establishment of pride. Through the years, I've had the pleasure of telling our story to folks coming by our booth at the Boston Pride Festival. And because this year, like last, has been a little bit different, let me instead tell the story this evening. The story of how MCC was able to hold the first Pride Parade is a story of both perseverance and divine intervention. It was perseverance that wore down the police commissioner after hours of testimony which Reverend Troy Perry um, was berated during that testimony and challenged on the legalities of being gay. And it was divine intervention that equipped Troy Perry with the words and de the de demeanor necessary, allowing him to thank Police Chief Davis for his honesty when he compared homosexuals to robbers and thieves. Troy said of that day that he understood then what Daniel felt like when he walked into the den of lions. Beyond the approval, the police commission enacted what they assumed to be impassable obstacles. The first barrier required MCC to post two bonds totaling $1.5 million to cover the broken storefront windows along the parade route from rocks being thrown at the marchers that missed their targets and instead hit and break the windows. The second obstacle was that there be at least 3,000 marchers. Again, divine intervention stepped in, manifesting itself as immediate assistance from the ACLU. With their help, both restrictions were dismissed. The only remaining problem was that the parade date had been already set at the meeting with the police commissioner, leaving only two days to organize a parade. MCC met that challenge as the parade kicked off from Hollywood and Highland Avenue on June 28, 1970, as scheduled. The parade began with Reverend Perry's friend and roommate, Willie Smith, driving his VW microbus equipped with an amplification system playing recordings of old World War II German marches. Beyond Willie marched the Society of Anibis, a semi-secret homophile conservative society with a float that included a likeness of the goddess of Anibis riding a white stallion. Behind the Anibis group was the advocate float overflowing with groovy guys in bikinis intended to energize the crowd, which they did. Behind the Bikini Boys was the group Focus, a conservative gay group that carried the signs, homosexuals for Ronald Reagan. One woman spectator was heard making the comment, I can forgive them for being homosexual, but not for being for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Behind the, behind the focus group was the group Gay Liberation, who marched with banners while shouting, two, four, six, eight, gay is just as good as straight. The Gay Liberation marchers were followed by their float with a handsome young man fastened to a cross with the banner above stating, in memory of those killed by the pigs. As expected, this stunned and chilled the mood of the spectators, so the float was followed by the Gay Lib Guerrilla Theater, whose participants were drag performers in gauzy pastel costumes running away from other performers dressed as club welding vice cops. Behind the theater group was a group carrying a large sign that read, Heterosexuals for Homosexual Freedom, with a fife and drum corps accompanying the banner. 
Behind the supporting heterosexuals came the homosexual pet walkers, with pets being carried, led, or pushed in elaborately decorated outfits and carts. One rather masculine walker with a husky carried the sign, all of us don't walk poodles. Behind the pet walkers was the Society of Pat Rocco, Enlightened Enthusiasts, which was a group of colorfully costumed adult entertainers associated with that film production company. MCC was last in the parade with Reverend Troy Perry in a convertible, followed by the, L the LA MCC congregation singing Onward Christian Soldiers. Reverend Troy later said we were gay and we were proud and we had come out of our closets and into the streets and we were applauded for our courage. Church family, much has changed since that first Pride Parade. We have learned to be much more inclusive and intentional toward the whole LGBTQI plus spectrum. We have learned better not to act like prey. We have learned that God is greater than AIDS. We have stepped up and spoke out and marriage equality became the law of the land. This first Pride Parade and advocacies make up some of the history that is MCC. Let us be proud of our association with MCC and take our rightful place as stewards of this movement. So this week, pray for the continued success of the mission and ministry of MCC. For now, as the basket is presented, please give as you are able. And may God continue to bless you and MCC Boston. Thank you. <laughs> 